Uh, my name is Lisa Pelling. I'm chief analyst at the think tank Arena Idea. That is very happy to co-host this event together with End Ecoside Sweden. I will just shortly give uh, the floor to Pella Thiel to tell us a little bit about End Ecoside and the initiatives that they are working with. But before that, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a welcome on behalf of the think tank Arena Idea. Some of you have been here and you've been here many times. We just uh, today finalized our annual report for last year and we organized 57 <coughs> events last year. So like every six days <laughs> we had an event. Mm -hmm. and, that, and then, you know, <laughs> on top of that, we're in loads and loads of other events participating. So we often meet here and, and we'd like you to come back. Uh, we, we find this is a nice way of meeting over, uh, over lunch. Uh, you have a nice sandwich and a nice interesting speech and a possibility to talk to each other and to ask questions. So I, I want to say that before I say anything else, the reason we've asked you to come and be with us physically is because we want to give you the opportunity to ask questions. Otherwise, there would be no point. We could just you do a Skype conference or just uh, uh, film you and then put it online. So you're here, make use of the fact that you are uh, here. So the Think Tank Arena Idea is an independent, uh, politically independent Think Tank. Our main funders are the Swedish trade union movement, the blue collar uh, unions, uh, the metal workers union, the civil, uh, the municipal workers union, Kommunal, and the workers in the commercial sector, Handels, are our main funders. But we are funded also from white collar uh, unions and the academic uh, unions uh, as well, and we do have. Um, activities uh, such as book publishing, we publish reports. We have two uh, uh, quite successful podcasts. If you're into migration <coughs> issues, I will be recording one more. Uh, I think it's the 23rd issue of the podcast, Migration and Mellichor och Migration, and we have a podcast about economic issues that sends also every, every two weeks, so that's for you to discover uh, more. Uh, but as I said today, we are co-organizing this uh, event with End Ecosai. Would you like to say something about your activities before yeah, sure. I introduce the speakers? Thank you. That's very impressive what you're doing. Um, so we are a small group of people, an, an NGO, and Ecosai Sweden, part of a larger international network working to promote um, Ecosai as an international crime. And my name is Tella Thiel. Some of you have met me before uh, together with Polly Higgins, who is a very vocal advocate for this cause. And uh, we held an, a conference on ecocide and nature's rights three years ago, which was the first in Sweden. And now this weekend we held the second one. We call it Earth Rights Conference. And uh, we wanted to look at the bigger framework around the ecocide law, which is Earth Rights. And because this is quite a new movement, we really had the opportunity to invite as keynotes some of the, the prime movers globally in, in this movement. And, Mari Margit is, is one of them, so it's been a, a blessing having you here. Uh, I put out some flyers from the conference because we will continue to put out some um, materials from the conference if you're interested in that. Excellent. And we're very happy to co uh, host this event. I, I, I don't, it's the first time we do something no. together, but don't yeah. think, I don't think it's, it's the last, last. time. No. We already conspired to do something in, in June, and there might be more to come. Uh, so I hope you don't mind if we will add you to our address list and, and send you an invitation to the coming uh, event as well, so that you can join us next time as well. Thank you so much, Pella. So uh, now uh, to our main guest today, Mari Marjul. I am so happy that you could make it. I know you've had a very intensive uh, weekend full of discussions and presentations. I think you're doing some other presentations whilst you're here in, in Stockholm as well. So I'm happy that you can make it here today. You are the co-director of the, uh, the associate director of the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And there you lead this organization's International Center for the Rights of Nature. So for a discussion on the rights of nature and how defining rights of nature, conceptualizing rights of nature, 
using rights of nature and this concept as a tool for sustainable development, I couldn't think of anyone better to, to invite. And I'm very much looking forward to, to your speech. We have also been very happy and proud to have uh, a very prominent commentator today. We've asked Jonas Edison, who is a professor at, of environmental law at the uh, Department of Law at Stockholm University, and he has offered to make uh, a comment on this on Mari's uh, presentation and also on the, on the, uh, on the Swedish context of this concept uh, that I think also would be a good input into the discussion and the conversation and the debate that I hope that we will have uh, after the, the presentations. So with that, Mari, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Is this, is this on? Is that, ooh. The end. <laughs> but let's, let's, uh, let's take this off. We we'll take this off. Okay. And, and, I'll talk and, about that. Yes. And we, um, can I? Sure. Yeah. And I, I give you mine. This one would work for him. That's fine. We try, we try with this one. No, this one should be Is this one on? Oh, I don't know. Yes. Oh, here, I'll put it on there. No, it's okay. It's okay. Is that better? Can you hear me? It was a yes. feedback between the speaker just yes. above your head there. So if you stand to the, the, with the other table. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? Yes. 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 Perfect. Okay. All right, I'm going to admit Sorry. something. Uh, my brother works for Bose. <laughs> so it's his fault. I'll tell him. Thank you. Uh, is that? Yes, for, I can't tell. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you to Pella and the N Ecoside group and Loden as well, which have um, invited me here, my organization here, to participate at the Earth Rights Conference last week, uh, over the weekend, and the different meetings that we've been having um, over these few days. Uh, we were in Uppsala yesterday, which I learned is not Uppsala, but is Uppsala. I was happy about it. Yeah, you're all laughing at me because everyone laughs at me about that. Um, we've had a we've had a good a good opportunity, I think, to meet and discuss this concept of the rights of nature with a lot of different people. This morning, we were over um, at Parliament. We met with some members of the Green Party to discuss what the rights of nature is, why. People are advancing the rights of nature in different countries. Um, I think it was a very, very good conversation. And I think it's uh, quite pleased that we could be here uh, this afternoon as well. So just very briefly, I work for an organization, and if you have the handout, you'll see, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. And I head up our International Center for the Rights of Nature. We are a, an environmental NGO, and we're based in the United States. Um, so we now work outside of the United States as well. We began as a very uh, conventional environmental NGO with the purpose of helping people and communities protect the environment from particular environmental threats. In the, in the United States, as you may know, for example, we have a great deal of fracking happening. Um, and so we have a work with a number of communities that are trying to stop fracking from coming into their community for all of the reasons we can discuss. But, uh, we started out in 1995 um, as very conventional, and what I mean by that is, like other environmental organizations, we focused on trying to better regulate activities, you know, like mining or uh, drilling or factory farms, which we have a great deal of in the United States, and we tried to um, do the work of what we call uh, stopping permits or permissions that are given by government to industry to corporations to conduct certain activities. <coughs> and what we went through a very long learning process in that, in that we discovered that it was very difficult to stop the government from issuing permission or issuing a permit 
to a corporation. Um, is there feedback? Oh, I did. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Don't be too close to your brother. I know. <laughs> I'll tell him. Um, so what we learned was that because environmental laws um, issue permissions or permits um, to corporations to conduct any number of kind of activities, we learned that environmental laws actually legalize environmental harm. So they legalize fracking, they legalize mining, they legalize factory farms, they legalize the privatization of water sources, they legalize all sorts of kinds of practices that communities and people are trying to stop because they are harming the environment. And our, when we move from that understanding to, and here I, okay, sorry. <laughs> that environmental laws not only legalize these kinds of activities, essentially they're based on this premise that we as human beings um, have the ability to use nature to suit our needs, to benefit humankind. And indeed our, our laws reflect this because our laws treat nature as property under the law so, or as a commodity under the law, which means that environmental laws regulate our use of that property, our use of nature, which makes sense if we are our environmental laws, which we think are about protecting the environment, when in fact environmental laws are regulating how humans use the environment. So that means that it's treated as property under the law. Nature is considered rightless. It has no right to exist. It has no right to flourish or regenerate or to evolve. And that's you know thousands of years of history now that legal systems treat nature as property. And as a result of that, you know we've had our major environmental laws in the United States and laws which are now mirrored in countries around the world, these laws have been put in place now for 40, 50 years. And we can see the consequences of it very clearly. Um, you know, climate change accelerating, species extinction accelerating, ecosystem collapse accelerating under environmental laws that are in place all over the world. And the question is, well, why? Why don't environmental laws work? Well, through our work in the US, um, we discovered that environmental laws don't work when we treat nature as property. We, environmental laws don't work because they were never written to protect the environment. I'll say that again. Environmental laws were not written to protect the environment. Environmental laws were written to regulate human use of the environment. And that's a difficult concept sometimes for us to get our minds around. It took us a while to understand that. It took us a while to understand that environmental laws reflect larger legal systems. Larger legal systems in the United States and around the world are primarily focused on how do we continually have more growth, more development, more production, more extraction. The primary aim of governmental systems, legal systems around the world is how do we continue that constant development, constant human development. And to fund that, to provide for that, our environmental laws necessarily have to regulate how quickly we can take the raw materials out of nature that we need to fund that constant growth. So we went through a process to understand how not only do environmental laws regulate human use of nature, but also that larger legal systems protect that, insulate that, and champion that in order um, to advance the power, to grow the power of a, of a nation, to grow the economy of a nation. And that was a, a, a process that came to us to understand that it's not that our environmental laws aren't strong enough, that we need to try to better regulate fracking or better regulate mining because by regulating them, we're allowing them to happen. And our communities and people don't want them at all. They understand that those kinds of activities are inherently incompatible with protection of the natural world. And under these legal systems and environmental laws around the world, we see that the very fabric of life is now at risk. Um, we see the collapse of the living systems that we all need in order to survive. Um, things are getting very, very dire. And perhaps you wouldn't be here if you didn't think so as well. So that took us on a journey of understanding about how existing legal systems work. And we looked at what did other movements do, other past movements of people do when they came up against a legal system, an economy, and a culture that was they considered to be destructive or oppressive or perhaps unjust or illegitimate. What did other movements have to do in order to fundamentally change how governing and law occurred? So 
Um, we looked at movements like the abolitionist movement in the United States, which worked to end slavery and recognize rights of the freed slaves. Our constitution codified slavery, and so they had to attack the very basic structure of law. Suffragists, and, and some of the folks in this room have heard me say this a few times already, but it was very interesting for me before I came here. Not only was I looking and reading the environmental code, I was very interested to understand what do past movements look like here in Sweden? What kind of history do you have? Is it similar to our experience in the United States? And indeed, it is. there are similarities. So the suffragist movement here in Sweden spent generations advocating for the right of women to vote. And it began at the local level, and ultimately in the 1920s, much like in the United States, that women secured the right to vote at the national level. And what did those movements have to do? Well, those movements had to understand that the problem they faced was systemic. It was based in the structure of law itself. And today we have a systemic problem. It's not that we want to regulate factory farms better, or regulate fracking better, or mining better, or other kinds of activities like that. It's the system of law itself which is the problem. Systems of law which are based on constant growth and expansion. And that, it's a systemic problem. And understanding that, we had to reframe, re-understand, like, learn anew what the problem we faced was as an environmental group. And so we finally came to a place where we understood we need to, if we're going to attack a systemic <laughs> problem, we need to ourselves be advocating for systemic change. So like past movements, you know, the abolitionists weren't trying to regulate the practice of slavery better. They didn't want to see improved slave codes, which is what our laws were that regulated how slavery could occur. They wanted to end it all together. Women weren't trying to have better uh, improve their situation under a structure of law that didn't recognize them as having rights, they wanted to change that system altogether. And so they had to address the structure itself. And that's where we are today. Slaves were treated, treated as property under the law. Women were treated as property under the law. Today, legal systems treat nature as property under the law. And much like those past movements had to transform that which was treated as property under the law to being rights bearing, Today, nature, similarly, we are seeing a need to transfer it from being property under the law to being rights bearing. And that's the work, the journey that we began a little over 10 years ago now, in which we began working with the very first communities in the United States to recognize inherent rights of nature. So the, some of you have the handout. In 2006, we assisted the first community in the United States. It's called Tamaqua Borough. We assisted them to draft the first law in the United States, as well as in the world, that recognized the rights of nature in binding law. That recognized a right to exist for nature, a right to uh, flourish, a right to uh, res restoration and regeneration. Today, we now have dozens of communities across 10 states in my country that have established that nature has a right to exist and flourish within binding law, and that people and their governments have the legal authority to essentially stand in the shoes of nature to defend and enforce those rights on behalf of nature. Back in 2008, as this work was really just beginning in the United States, Ecuador was drafting a new constitution and we were invited into Ecuador to meet with their constituent assembly, which was essentially that constitutional convention, if you will, that delegates brought together to draft the new constitution. We met with them and, you know, long story short, we worked with them to draft provisions to recognize the rights of nature, to enshrine it within their new constitution. And indeed, in 2008, they promulgated their new constitution, making Ecuador the first country in the world to enshrine constitutional rights of nature. And the question is, why? Why are we doing this? Well, it's about advancing systemic change. It also comes with an understanding that so long as nature is treated as solely existing for human use, well, the consequences of that are very clear. <coughs> Environmental systems are declining around the world. You know, in Ecuador, within their constitution, they have secured a human right to a healthy environment. Now, I think it's somewhere upwards of 90 countries around the world have a human right to a healthy environment in law. But what's become increasingly clear is that we cannot fulfill or exercise our right to a healthy environment if the environment itself does not have recognized rights. So this work is building. Um, 
And in places like India, where we've been working for a number of years, you might be familiar with the Ganges River, which is a very polluted, very denigrated ecosystem. There was a case that was decided in March, so just three or four weeks ago, in which the court, the upper, um, a high court in the state of Uttarakhand, the court found that because of just how grave the situation there, the, co the court wrote that the very existence of the river is at stake because of how the, the, the situation of the river being so polluted. They went so far as to say that legal personality, recognizing it for the river within that state, that the Ganges has legal personality with certain rights. They felt they needed to take that extraordinary measure to transform how nature is treated under the law in order to protect and conserve and restore that river system. So we're beginning to see not only direct making of law um, at the national level, at the local level, but also courts now beginning to move in this direction as well. Um, we've worked as well in places like Ghana and Colombia. We're working in Australia. You may be familiar with the Great Barrier Reef. This was just in the news a few weeks ago. They're finding that something um, hundreds of kilometers, maybe more, thousands of kilometers um, of the Great Barrier Reef are experiencing die-off and bleaching, much like coral reefs around the world. Well, coral reefs provide habitat for upwards of 9 million species, and they're dying around the world, and that's going to have grave consequences for the natural world. And so we're now working with groups in Australia to begin campaigns to recognize rights of the Great Barrier Reef. I mentioned in India this high court decision. We've been working there on national legislation to recognize rights of the Ganges River, which we've presented to Prime Minister Modi's government, and they're now taking it into consideration, boosted by that state court decision from a few weeks ago. Um, that this need to transform humankind's relationship with the natural world is essential, not only to our own survival, but the survival of the natural world. Um, we're working in other places as well. Um, so as we were talking with the Green Party uh, members just an hour or so ago, I was sharing with them that last year we worked with the Green Party of England and Wales to draft a new policy platform on the rights of nature, which lays out why rights of nature and then calls for new laws within the UK um, to recognize that nature has rights and that we need to enforce these rights. We're working in other countries as well. Um, and what's really interesting, when you're at the beginning of a new movement, you don't, it's unpredictable how it's going to move forward. None of these things ever move in a straight line. But what we've seen happen now um, in places like Ecuador, which has it in the Constitution, and Bolivia now has a national rights of nature, what they call the law of the rights of Mother Earth. Um, in Ecuador, we've had the first cases go all the way up to the Constitutional Court, in which people are bringing cases in the name of, on behalf of ecosystems to defend and enforce their own rights. So the first case that was decided in 2011 was for the Vilcabamba River, um, which was being impacted by government road construction, interfering with the natural flow of the river and putting debris and other things into the river, which was impacting that ecosystem. People uh, brought a case in the name of the river. So the river was the party in the case bringing a case to defend and enforce its own rights, saying that its rights were being violated by the government road construction. And the court ultimately agreed, affirming that nature has constitutional rights and requiring certain instructions as to how the government needed to restore and change its behavior toward the river ecosystem. We've had other cases now um, in Ecuador as well, in which the courts find that nature not only has constitutional rights, but that those rights are what the court described as transversal, meaning that the rights of nature within the Constitution affect other rights in the Constitution. So within the Constitution, as I said, they have a constitutional right, a human right to a healthy environment. They have a human right to water. The court said that essentially that because the rights of nature are transversal, they impact those rights. And of course they impact those rights because I can't fulfill my human right to water if water ecosystems are damaged and polluted. I can't fulfill my human right to a healthy environment if the environment itself doesn't have a similar level of protection. And so we're seeing the development of this, the evolution of this in Ecuador. We have a case now in the United States where we have an oil and gas company is seeking to put uh, frack wastewater and wells into the community to dump that toxic waste within the community. My organization, our legal team, um, is 
representing the Crystal Spring watershed there. This is a place called Highland Township in western Pennsylvania in that state, um, seeking to intervene into this lawsuit to because the corporation is saying it has a right to dump frac waste into the community and the watershed saying we have a right to not have frac waste dumped inside inside our ecosystems. And so you have this beginning to evolve within the law, within the courts, um, and more and more people are taking this up. Um, and so, you know, as we continue this work, we were really pleased to be able to come here. You know, you may be familiar that uh, I think it was 2014, 2015, some of the members of the Green Party, some of whom actually that we met with today, introduced a measure, a motion into um, the Riksdag uh, to for, I think it was called forming a committee or a commission um, to look at Swedish law and how we could incorporate the rights of nature into Swedish law. And so we had some conversation about that today. I mean, there's already been a little bit of movement here in Sweden. Um, and, you know, we talked about what strategies we might take going forward. I think the conference this weekend, the Earth Rights Conference, was another important step forward for raising awareness about rights of nature. And believe me, I understand Sweden has a strong reputation as an environmental leader um, and we think that this is an opportunity perhaps for Sweden to become an environmental leader once again, perhaps becoming the first country in Europe to recognize the rights of nature and to law. That would be an extraordinary step forward to really transform how nature is treated under the law, transform our human relationship with nature because what we learned in looking at past movements and learning from our own history in the United States and me learning about the suffrage movement here in Sweden is that the kind of shift that we need, the kind of transformation that we need if human beings are going to continue to occupy this planet, that we need a fundamental shift not only in how you and I behave, you know, whether we drive a hybrid car or we recycle or we ride a bicycle, it needs much more than that. It's not only a, a mind shift that we need, a shift in our culture toward nature. We need to drive that change into law. So like past movements, you know, with the abolitionists, it wasn't that they just wanted people to treat their slaves a little bit better. That wasn't enough. They needed to end slavery, free the slaves, and recognize them as having inherent rights of their own. Today, it's not enough for us to try to be nicer to nature. We need to fundamentally shift our relationship with nature. And that means not only how we think about nature, but how we govern our own behavior toward nature. And for us, that means transforming how the law treats nature from being property to being rights bearing in its own right. Um, and empowering necessarily people and government to defend and enforce those rights. To us, that is the direction that this work needs to go. It's building in the United States, Ecuador, other countries, um, and hopefully we'll see some of that moving forward in Sweden as well. Thank you. I'd like to ask you, um, a question first, because I, you know there, there are so many questions we can ask, and I'm sure that, that, that after Jonas has made his presentation, we will have some answers and many more questions uh, as well. One one of the things that we've been working with is this think tank, as I said, yeah. we are a think tank that comes from the trade union movements. So obviously, issues that are related to labor law are important for us, but also. Uh, issues that are related to what we uh, try to establish as a concept called movement law. So how law can be used as a tool for social movement. Yeah. Uh, how you can conceptualize of law as something that's not done in the legal offices of fancy bureaus downtown, <laughs> but of something that is actually a tool of people, particularly maybe in marginalized situations and in marginalized areas, neighborhoods, um, parts of society. So we've, we've done a number of activities on stop and frisk, uh, you know, when, when particularly marginalized young people are often uh, racified, young people in the suburbs get stopped whenever they try and move in their neighborhoods <coughs> or downtown by the police who demand for their identity cards. So this is one thing that we've, we've tried to put our searchlights uh, on. We are in a month from now publishing an anthology of different writers who we've asked among loyal legal scholars and activists in Sweden <coughs> to uh, discuss with us what the concept of the right to write could be in yes. Sweden in this context. Or are there particular groups in society that have a problem uh, 
uh, having their rights respected when they ask for unemployment benefits, when they are in contact with uh, health insurance, uh, when they are in family, um, <coughs> Um, uh, what do you say, um, uh, disputes, disputes on, on, on uh, related to, to, to family law. So that, that's one thing that we're you know, trying to dig into these issues. It's, it's a long introduction to present my question and this, I, I'd like you to, because I think it's extremely interesting to hear how this issue of the rights of nature has been particularly powerful for communities that, if I know, understand you correctly, are marginalized by all senses. There are people living in remote <coughs> areas, many people, the people that are, have low incomes, maybe are far from power in the country where they live, and still you have managed to somehow give them this, this tool to also claim what I would interpret as their rights to livelihood, to a secure environment, but they've done this through conceptualizing the rights of the river, where they fish, where they live, where they have their drinking water. Could you, could you say something about the, this connection between marginalized groups of people and, and, and the rights of nature? Yes, I think it's actually very interesting. The first laws that we worked on on the rights of nature were in very small, rural, often farming communities, and uh, often um, places where the word environmentalist was un not only unfamiliar, but might have been considered like a dirty word. Um, you know, people who feel very close to the land and they don't want other people telling them what to do with their land. Uh, and that's very American. Um, but these places are, you know, they don't have very <laughs> big populations. They're not in cities and they're very, they don't have a lot of political power. And in the United States, um, industry often thinks of these places as sacrifice zones. Places that you can essentially do whatever you need to do because they don't have enough power to stop you and they're not going to be able to raise enough of a fuss to make it a political problem for them. So you're quite right. And the question is why those people don't sound like the, the folks that would move the rights of nature forward first. But it's very interesting. Um, these are communities that you know, they say, don't tell us what to do with our land, don't tell us what you can do in our community, yet they faced things like um, toxic sludge coming in or factory farms coming in. And what they learned was that under our state and national laws in the United States, within the community, they don't have the legal authority to say no to those practices coming in. It's very similar, you have a situation similarly here in Sweden, and I don't pretend to be an expert on it, but it's very similar that communities don't have a lot of legal authority here in Sweden to stop things like that kind of threat from coming in. That's the same in the United States, and really it's, we see it everywhere in the world. And so these communities may not have come at things because they were concerned about factory farms and maybe the environmental or public health consequences or the same thing with mining or whatever it might be, but really what brought those communities together was this idea that they didn't have the ability to govern their own community. And it became, a, well, you call it a democracy movement in the United States, meaning that they discovered that they didn't have a, a fracking problem. They didn't have a mining problem. They had a fundamental democracy problem because they couldn't decide what happened in their own community. And that actually is what brought people from across the political spectrum really to come around this for the first time because it wasn't, you know, they, many of them of course were concerned about the impacts on nature, but they were, the larger concern about the democracy problem was really what brought them. And I think that's very galvanizing and we've seen that galvanize communities of all different political backgrounds um, together. And I just wanted to say something about, you started out by talking about uh, movement lawyers. We have a conversation about what does it mean to be a movement lawyer quite often. And that means we think, um, you know, with our legal team, we talk about this a lot and look at other movements and how do they, ter you know, contemporary movements and past movements, and that it required us to not just see the law as it is, but as it can be, how it needs to be, and then figure out the pathway there. We, our organization is made up of um, organizers and lawyers and together figuring out how do we support each other's work because we understand it's, in order to make this kind of funnel shift, fundamental shift, just like other movements, we have to change not only our culture, but the law. And those two things support and drive each other forward. And so being movement lawyers is really, really important in understanding that lawyers can fulfill that role. Um, and that means 
being willing to look beyond what it currently exists, which I think a lot of you know, lawyers get trapped in it. Um, but looking beyond and figuring out how do we get there and what does it mean not only just to do it through the courts, but also to move people, to mobilize people to advance that kind of change. Wow, so many thoughts. I, 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 I cannot help to tell you that we are organizing a summer school this year for the first time for young uh, lawyers, students of law who want to devote or look at into devoting their legal career into being movement lawyer. Ah. You know, we'll offer them, you know, what, what would it be, what do they need to learn, how could they, what kind of career could you do as a movement lawyer, and if you want to go out in your community, what, what, what kind of skills do you want? So we do that for the first time together with the Swedish Tenants Association, Hedus Jest Reningen, which is the, the largest employer of, uh, one of the largest employers of lawyers in, in Sweden, because of all the counseling they do, and together with the Organizational <coughs> Association of the F. So, uh, if you are on our mailing list, I'm sure you will you will you will get an invitation as well to to find uh, people, young people in your in, in your surroundings that can, that can join the, the summer school. Now, Jonas Ebbesson, please uh, join us uh, up here. Uh, I think I could now that we found out what yes. Now that we found out what the problem is, I think. I'm, Should I? Can I sit down? Uh, um, Should if, I? If you want. Uh, Whatever yes. you. You may stay. Uh, shall I stay a bit further away from your brother, yes. or, or, or <laughs> <laughs> we can or be, be, be closer? Let's just try together. Yep. So, Professor of Environmental Law at the Legal Department of Stockholm University. Well. So, thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you very much, Mary, for uh, your interesting opening. Uh, presentation, which of course links into a topic that uh, several NGOs around the world and several local communities, politicians and members of the public are, con are uh, aware of and uh, concerned about. And I think that I appreciate these kind of efforts to highlight the difficulties in dealing with environmental measures and to try to identify what are the main hurdles and what are the, whether it is technical legal matters or more fundamental notions of how we think. And you addressed some of these that I would, and I would much agree uh, on that. For instance, the concept of property is indeed a problem mm -hmm. here. And of course, property rights are not as such a given concept. They differ from one country to the other. There is a strong perception, in particularly from industries and from landowners, that property rights are somehow absolute. That if you have a property, no one can challenge that. But that, of course, is not correct. There are many ways and a lot of uh, case law in various countries to show how you can challenge and how you can balance that in a more sophisticated manner. However, I think that by only identifying property rights or the notion of economic growth, which you also rightly identifies as a, as a problem to our thinking, we take a too simple a view. Much of the problems we have with uh, environmental protection and with dealing with environmental issues relates also to our ambitions in terms of welfare law. What we are doing in all our lives. We are here a group of very engaged citizens, politically concerned, and we, are, we care about the environment. But let me ask you honestly, how many in this room has a mobile phone which is older than three years old? Put your hands up. <laughs> well, there are more than usually, but still you are indeed a minority in this group. What is in your cell phone, that you, the previous one, the two or three or four or five that you had before? So we are very environmentally concerned. Still, we, we, we change cell phones, not like we change shirts, but we do that on a very regular basis. I'm sure that in your cell phone you will find metal pieces that come from Central Africa. You may be very supportive to what's happening in the, uh, the Congo and, and elsewhere, but still we have these phones. And what I'm trying to say is that almost every issue, whether we talk about production of paper, infrastructure, energy production, they <coughs> have an impact on the environment, and we cannot avoid that. We cannot ignore that fact when we try to look at how to deal with these things. And whether we bestow rights to nature or not, we still have to address these basic issues. If we, if we want to have a certain uh, human rights to energy, the energy must come from somewhere. And we cannot simply ignore that, even though we are very, want to be very ambitious and, and progressive. Now, for sure, we can uh, bestow rights to the environment or to sp protection of species. When I have tried to use this as a test for my students, I say, why don't, why don't we give legal rights to, to species, to, to elks and bears and, and bears, what have you? And they look very 
surprised and they're wondering if I'm serious. And so you cannot give rights to species. How do we know what they want, they would say. And I said, well, we have pretty much in the line what you referred to and what Christopher Stone, the American lawyer who wrote this book about giving standing to trees was pointing out. We, have, we, we give rights to children or to people who are mentally not very aware, but even though we don't know exactly what they need. When we teach students about corporate law, they have no problem to grant human features to corporations. We think that they have acted with negligence. We think that they have rights. The European Court of Human Rights recognized that multi-billion companies have human rights. In the US, they have civil rights, very much because we think of them as legal persons. So for sure, we can also use that concept to, uh, on nature. And probably it's easier to, um, to see what, how uh, an individual elk feeds than a huge multinational company. I mean, you can see what, what is harmful. So we can do that. And I think it could be useful. But we need to think, what do we do this more from a conceptual basis? Because we think that, yes, there are some inherent rights. Or do we do this strategically? And I think you can achieve a lot by recognizing these rights and to have a counter right. But there is no guarantee in achieving a better climate just by granting rights to nature or by solving the protection of rivers just by giving them rights. Because at the end of the day, even those local communities will need to use water. So there are fairness issues that we should address. And we can do it by identifying rights that should be balanced. But you can also achieve much of that without recognizing specific rights to nature. And yet, what I think is just as important is that we have the possibility, and that links <coughs> to the last point, I think, by, by Lisa and you, that we have possibilities to really invoke and use also the laws that are in place. You said that uh, the problem is not the existing environmental laws. On that, I would strongly disagree. I think we have a lot of environmental laws that are inadequate, that should be developed further. But we also have laws, and we have several examples in Sweden, where we have laws that go rather far <coughs> in being radical in protecting the nation. But there has not been, until recently, at least, there's not been anyone who has been able to highlight that or to bring that to court, except for local authorities. For instance, we have rather comprehensive protection for forests that are in our mountain areas. It's rather small part, but they are giving a certain right. So you're not allowed to cut down these forests without a specific permit. Now, if you ask for that permit and it's denied, as a landowner, you can appeal that and go to court. And finally, you may get your permit. But if you are given the permit, until recently, the only body that was able to, to uh, challenge that decision, to say, well, that is not in, com in compliance with the law, was the Central Forestry Agency. And those of you who know anything about this know that that is one of the most, I wouldn't say corrupt, but it's very much, it's one of the, the authorities which is mostly embedded in private interest in Sweden. I don't think that any other environment authority dealing with environmental issues is so much linked into the activity that is uh, intended to, to control. sitting on two chairs, you could say. Yeah, really. Uh, but I mean, other mm -hmm. authorities, in, we, if you speak about the Chemical Inspectorate, mm -hmm. the Environment Protection Agency, they have been the same. But I think that they are not sitting on the lap of the industry to the extent <laughs> that I think that. Anyway. This decision was recently challenged by an NGO, and they have no standing rights under the, the forest bill to challenge. However, the, the court, the Supreme Administrative Court, finally gave them that right to challenge. And by that, you can also have these permits denied. So what I'm saying is that it is very important to have someone to do that. We have rights for, for um, animals in domestic treatment. But there are few opportunities for NGOs to challenge if a farmer does not give uh, those um, follow those restrictions. And that to me is just as important as giving them rights, because by giving rights, you can achieve something, but it's not in itself uh, a guarantee. I think I stop there, and then we can have a bit of the discussion. Good, thank you. Wow. <laughs> More, now we are, we are we, I, I was just set in this uh, uh, mood of being myself, uh, one of your students. I was like, wow, you know, if I was to write a paper, where would I start? And, and how, would I, how would I structure it? Extremely interesting to, to discuss these, these issues. Do you want to comment upon the comment? Do you want to add anything now? Or should we just? Yeah, let's just open it, shall we? Let's just open it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I told the two of you before we started that in this audience, we have people from 
uh, the political parties, I know the Green parties here, we have some people representing different kinds of corporate interests, there are many of you are NGO activists, I think many of you are lawyers, but some of you are not lawyers. So I think it's, it's a quite diverse uh, audience, and I, and I hope the, the questions will reflect that. We will answer in English, but you are welcome to pose your question in Swedish, and we will help you uh, translate if you feel more comfortable in, in, uh, in, in Swedish. I have, I have a microphone, and, and please, uh, if you don't mind, just tell who you, who you are when you ask the, ask the question. First, you know. So who wants to be first? <laughs> Uh, hello, Mikael Karlsson from Eco Forestry Foundation. Since uh, 1993 we have a new forestry law in Sweden that equal the right of production and, and nature. How come nothing have happened? <laughs> I can just give a very oh, 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 sorry I have this. <laughs> no, I think that I touched upon that point that we have a law which has a rather ambitious provision. Yes. To, to more or less to equalize, to have biological con uh, diversity, yes, as important as forestry. But it has not been achieved. And part of it, I think, is that because that the, the authority that is supposed to make sure that that is um, implemented has not done its homework, and it, there's been no other opportunities for watchdogs to bring case to court. But I'm, I'm not saying that bringing case to court is always the, the, the solution either. But if, if the authorities don't do their job, there must be ways to control the control, to challenge their uh, acts and their omissions. And I think that is part, it's not all uh, of the problem. But assume that we have put in this provision that the forest have a right to exist, period. Without any other change, we would not have achieved anything unless you could also use that in court. And that is a bit my, my, my main uh, point. Thank you. So Yes, I am Lou Yard, uh, and uh, I'm representing Matilda Albert, which is a foundation, that, uh, it's a charitable foundation that raises funds in order to uh, acquire land with all good forest and with the single purpose of preserving biodiversity. So, this is a legal person that existed already in 2004, actually that also regulates within its statutes that the, the land uh, that is purchased cannot be logged, cannot be any, any forestry cannot take place or agriculture. And the land can never be sold. So this is a kind of legal person entity that actually gives the rights to the nature based on things only the nature. So um, it's also regulated by the, the, the law of foundations rather than nature. So it's, it's very much a legal person entity that is regulated by the laws of the legal persons. May I say so, it? Yeah. Sorry, did you have a question? Uh, no, no, I, I think what I see is that that, that kind of uh, construction also takes property into consideration. Yes. It still deserves property because in Sweden, Sweden we have 300,000 individual private or non so, so as you as said, 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 it's, it's a big issue. issue. To, to, there's there's a, a, today, today, there's a very, very polarized debate between property owners, owners and, and, and their representatives and, and big, big forestry, forestry companies. And, and on the other, other side, side uh, those, those who once wants to take take the So, so uh, and, and and what they come, they come up with, 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 with well, uh, if you want to uh, restrict our use, our use of far forest, and yeah. uh, uh, you are you're actually you're, you're, you're denying the rights, rights, rights of, of property. Yes, yes. you're taking our process. Yes, yes. 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 I think, I think it could be more, more powerful, powerful, more more yeah. fun fun because there was still still, still one thing, thing that was lacking funds. funds. Always. So yes. Fun, fun <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could do the same, I guess. Yeah. Um, I, d I wanted to say something yeah. with response to how you've what you've just described. I think 
um, is changing the ownership statute for that land. So in the United States, we, when we own a piece of land, like a forest, yeah. we have like a deed. It's called a deed. Um, that we own it, that's our document that shows, you know, essentially that we own it. We've now begun in the United States to help landowners, you know, we're at the very beginning of this part, um, but we've helped um, landowners to actually put within that ownership statute or deed for that piece of property, rights of nature. So recognizing rights of their, the nature on their property that is protected forever. It becomes part of, so even if the property is sold into the, in the future by the landowner, that that rights of nature goes with the property forever. So it might be something interesting, actually, for us to talk about. Um, but you're right about property rights. I mean, it's, um, they're sacred in the United States. It's sort of our, in our DNA um, that we have property and that we can do whatever really we want on that property. And that's, that's a big challenge, I mean, for conventional environmental laws and for the rights of nature. And the question is, do we think that, you know, I think, uh, did you, I'm sorry, did you tell me 50% of the forests are in private ownership now in Sweden, okay? So, I mean, if we think about that, is it, can we take 50% of the forests essentially off the table and not, and say we don't have, you know, because they're privately owned, those property rights override the need to protect the rights of nature on that property. Is it, can we sacrifice essentially 50% of the forest here in Sweden? Will that allow us to protect the overall environment here? I think we could probably argue no. Um, and so the question is, how do we help people who own property? You know, what do we do uh, if we have a conflict of rights between the rights of nature and the rights of property? And I think just the, sort of on a larger scale, when we think about recognizing rights of nature, it's not about stopping human development, or as in our country we would say, progress. Um, that it's stopping human development that interferes with the ability of ecosystems to exist and to thrive and to be functioning and healthy. So it's not about, we understand, you know, we're not eliminating humans off the planet and we are not eliminating cell phones or what have you. But it's how do we actually make it so that our behavior on the planet doesn't interfere with the ability of the planet to be healthy? Because that's what we're doing today. Uh, and there's no question about that. The question is, what do we do about it? Yeah. And, and, and that's what I also sympathize with. So of course, I, I took it as my role a little bit to challenge your points, but I can see that depending on in which legal system you are working on, on what issue, you may use different approaches. But I would say now when we look about uh, property rights that I think it's just as a useful and important strategy to point out that property rights are not absolute. For instance, if you own a piece of land in Sweden and it ha you happen to know that someone finds out that there is a huge oil resource underneath, as a landowner in Sweden, you would not have the immediate right to exploit it. And you would not be given any compensation if you were denied that. Because, and, and I think that so far is quite accepted here, that you have not, not an absolute right to do whatever you want with anything that is below that. And I think this is a crucial point for a first step. Also, with respect to fracking. Hmm. You would not be allowed to, now we, have, we don't have opportunities to frack for geological reasons so much in Sweden, but even if you had, you would not have that as a right and you would not necessarily granted compensation by being denied to do that. And I think this is also is an, is an alternative approach to read pretty much the, the ambitions that I think that you point out, that we need to make sure that we don't only uh, give benefits, we give priority to the rights to exploit. Well, a, a, way of, a way of challenging that would be to say, yeah, as a private property owner, you don't have that right, but the state Mm -hmm. has that right, mm -hmm. right? And, the, and, and there are many instances where the decisions of the state on how, whether to exploit that source of mineral as it is, uh, uh, conflicts with rights of reindeering uh, um, communities on the surface. And, and I'm not saying that that law is uh, perfect in any way. I'm just saying that at least it recognizes that private property is not <laughs> and it comes also to other notions of property. I know the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has recognized the communal or collective properties on indigenous populations in a rather positive manner to challenge the rights, the, the uh, activities of timber companies, etc., in Central and South America. So, but I mean, it depends on what you mean with property. That is my mind. Mm. So I have uh, Jens there and, and um, Magnus here. 
Hello, my name is Sian Swarbeck. I'm representing myself. Uh, but there was a time I represented the system, being a part of the government. But I have a question for you, Marie. What you talk about of a system change is actually a revolution. And in order to, to have a revolution come through, you have to have enough people who support it. Yes. So I want to know a little bit about your strategies. To say we have neither system change can often be very provocative and hard. Are there, do you think, tipping points that you can reach from examples? There are groups, for instance, the Great Ape Project, who wants to give legal rights to uh, primates or mm -hmm. great apes. Or do you think that you can have examples that could be supported by a majority so that you can have a revolution? I mean, you can have changes locally, but can you, can you create that and, give it, and have it a big support? Do you have a strategy for that? Uh, if, Please. You, if you don't mind, no, Mary, go ahead. take notes or take two, two, two more questions at the same time, because I think we are running out of time. Um, yes, I, I just need to take you in a little bit of, a, of an order here. I can do the next thing. Um, my name is Magnus Nils, and I, I um, also represent only myself. I've been uh, involved in environmental uh, organizations for decades. Uh, and I must admit, I have difficult to see what, what the, the, the notion of, of uh, nature right would add since uh, what is decided in the Ecuadorian constitution I guess was decided by politicians and when you change that majority I suppose that politicians who want to abolish those constitutional rights which I think is perfectly okay uh, and, and all those kinds of, of sort of um, overreaching principles for society they are introduced by man and they can be withdrawn by man. Uh, and uh, the problems we have, like like you're talking about fracking and, and other types of, of environmental destruction, aren't they simply a consequence of where the, where the power lies in societies in different er, 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 eras or whatever? We can talk about forestry. Why doesn't the forestry legislation deliver uh, the environmental goals in my mind because that was not the purpose the purpose was to give maximum freedom for the landowners to manage the forest however the, they like uh, it's called freedom under responsibility and uh, there are no incentives for a forest owner to take care of nature he or she will only pay for it and doesn't get anything back so of course, there is no uh, uh, environmental protection done in, in, in forestry. But again, aren't we talking about, aren't we sort of, the, how do you say, avoiding making this political, which you cannot, at the end of the day, avoid. This is politics. It's a, it's a matter of, of power balance between different interests. Wow. <laughs> Very important question indeed. I just took one more question and then... Hi, my name is Adam Jupp and I'm the environmental spokesperson of the Feminist Party. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very interesting to see that you have countries like Ecuador and you have other uh, South American countries like Bolivia and also African uh, countries that have, on a national level, um, written into the constitution of uh, protecting nature uh, in that sense. And it's also interesting to see local communities in the states that are directly affected by this also to, to have this politics enforced. And I think I don't think there's a coincidence that it's uh, in South America and Africa and you have local communities directly affected by this uh, mining or farming or fracking or whatever it might be. But my question is, uh, what do you think is the best <coughs> strategy of addressing this, because I think it's a problem of externalization when it comes to uh, the, the, sorry, the, about the mining and about uh, using our resources, and that in Sweden, for example, we're pretty far. We don't have that big agriculture, and we're pretty far from the production of what we consume and what we eat, and how, what is the best strategy of addressing this? Thank you. Thank you so much for very interesting questions. How to know if you yeah if you want to start, Mari, and then and Jonas as well. Yeah, I, 
so I think that uh, your question and your question are very related. Because um, you're both talking essentially what I think of as movements. And you asked about strategies. Um, and you talked about why is there a need for rights and isn't that just political? Um, the reason I emphasized uh, movements in my initial talk to you, my initial remarks, is because we see this as very much building a new people's movement, a new rights-based people's movements, past movements and contemporary movements. Um, and again, I, I speak to my country because we have all sorts of movements, social movements. Those movements are about advancing rights by expanding the body of legal rights to recognize somebody new into the world. You mentioned uh, Christopher Stone, and he has the book right there. That's a, um, a law professor in the United States who wrote this seminal law review article back in the 70s called Should Trees Have Standing? Um, and in it, uh, he writes about when we're talking about moving something, slaves, women, children, um, that which is considered property under the law and recognizing it as having legal rights. The idea initially, as he says, is considered laughable. This idea that slaves could have rights in the United States in the early days of abolition, that was considered laughable because the culture had done such a good strategic job of considering, of, of having us think. Our mindset was that black people, Africans, were uh, lesser than. They didn't have the ability to govern themselves. And so, of course, we needed to govern them. We had to regulate them. That they were, we had civilized them by putting them into slavery. So the culture had made that legitimize the need to treat them as property. And similarly, women, um, maybe this hasn't changed so much, but you know, we're considered the softer sex. We're considered too emotional to be able to do things like vote, um, God forbid. Um, and that we couldn't possibly be given these kinds of rights because that would cause all sorts of chaos. We've done the same thing with nature now. We, have, you know, we talk about the need to manage nature. We don't even call nature nature. We call it natural resources. Um, you know, and, and we think that nature can't govern itself. It can't just be. And your question about why recognize rights, the only reason we have to recognize rights at all is because <coughs> our, our inherent, my inherent right to health and well-being, my inherent right as a woman in the United States was being violated by the existing system. The only reason we write rights into law at all is because others are trampling on those rights. So, um, you know, when we recognize rights into law, when we're talking about rights, we're talking about putting the highest legal protection on them that we have as human beings. And that's the recognition of fundamental rights. And that means that when we recognize fundamental rights of what some, was well, something and now is rights bearing, that means we're placing the highest societal value on that. Now, I would say that it's interesting what happened in Ecuador. When we were invited into Ecuador in 2008, our expectation was is that they were not going to be actually including rights of nature in their constitution when it was all said and done. Because <coughs> we believe that movements drive change. So to your question, how do we see the strategy moving forward? We necessarily think there are some really key elements of movements that we've learned in our study of them, which are movements generally build from the grassroots. They build from people having these kinds of conversations and saying something seems wrong. What's wrong? And understanding what that problem is and then talking to more people and more people and building a broad base of people together. So our, in our work, we're trying to build a broad base. So across political lines, across racial lines, across gender lines, across class lines, economic lines, indigenous people, non-indigenous people, and even across now country lines. Because it, broad based movements are what drive fundamental change. So movements are characterized by building upward from the bottom and driving to the top. They're focused on changing the system itself, so that systemic <coughs> change. They're, uh, you know, three pillars. When we were at Uppsala, Uppsala yesterday, we talked with the students about there's really three key elements that characterize all successful movements. That they have, number one, they're focused on legal change. Number two, they have a strong education, uh, public awareness, element. People need to even understand what the problem is, that there is a problem before they're going to join any movement. So there's the driving at legal change, the education and awareness, 
And then the third piece of that is the mobilization, the organizing. All three of those impact each other. We have to change our minds in order to change the law. And we have to change the law in order to change our minds. Um, and so these things go together. And you're right. A new constitutional assembly could come in in Ecuador and take away those rights. When I said that we didn't think it would happen in Ecuador is because they didn't build a broad-based movement underneath it to support that change in the Constitution. We think that's necessary, and in some ways we're seeing that now. It's sort of kind of the opposite of how we would think it would work. You know, in the United States, we're building from the grassroots. And Ecuador started up at the national level because there were some people who really understood the need for this kind of rights of nature. Indigenous delegates, non-Indigenous delegates. But now we're seeing the people underneath, the indigenous peoples, non-indigenous peoples, communities, regular people saying, wait a minute, even our, our national administration under President Correa has not been supportive of the rights of nature. But so you're seeing people going other ways to actually build this movement in Ecuador from the bottom up to support what they already have in the constitution to protect it, hopefully to hold on to it. And so it sort of happened, uh, we wouldn't expect it to happen that way in most countries. But, there we are. But we definitely see this about building movements is absolutely essential. That systems change doesn't happen. We don't end slavery. We don't recognize the rights of women. We're not going to recognize the rights of nature without that broad-based movement, which aren't asking nicely for change. They are ultimately demanding that kind of change. They're forcing the existing system to be recognized as untenable. It no longer can stand, forcing it to change. And the last thing I'll say is on this is, you know, in the United States, you know, our U.S. Congress, uh, our president, uh, um, the U.S. Supreme Court, they are not leaders for change. They follow. And it's, this isn't just today. This is the history of the United States. They follow public sentiment. The U.S. Supreme Court is not, was not a leader to end slavery. The U.S. Congress was not a leader to recognize the rights of women. They had to be forced there by movements that forced that change in the culture, forced that change in the mindset, and ultimately made those institutions have to go forward with that change. Thank you. you wanna... Thank you very much. Well, I, I started off to say that as far as the ambition is concerned, I fully sympathize with this. And I think it's crucial to point out and to highlight more these kind of social movements and change that address unfairnesses, unsustainable patterns, and so forth. So there's both issues of injustice and, but they, and the long-term perspective about sustainability. And grassroots organizations are very good at highlighting that. And in order to revolutionize or be revolutionary mindset, you, you need to, to have rather strong <laughs> uh, approaches and catchwords to do that. And I, I think this is uh, something that I much support. I also think that the history you describe is important, that this is nothing to laugh about. And I hope I have not made any such impression no, that I'm not. No. Because, as I said, I, as you're perfectly right that this, historically you can see about the rights to, to people with dark complexion or females, whatever. As in certain segments of society, broad, broad one, they, were, they were laughing at suggestion of not, of, of giving the, granting these rights. There are some differences with respect to nature, but nevertheless, I think strategically you can do that. And you can, for sure, just like you have given granted rights to companies or uh, other legal persons, you can, you can grant rights to nature. But if you take rights as a concept seriously in legal terms, you, you must keep in mind that no right is absolute. I was saying, I should argue that property rights should not be understood as, as absolute. And if we were to introduce rights for nature, all kinds of nature in a way, not even that would be absolute, because you would have, as I think you point out in one of the papers, you would still have to balance that against other interests in some cases. If you want to provide energy, electricity, water supply, and other welfare. <coughs> and this is, this is a crucial point. So we, we must have an idea what we mean by, by granting rights. And I think, again, the approach taken in New Zealand may be very useful there. You can find it in other ways. But there are also alternative ways of highlighting public interests, injustices, unfairness, and unsustainable ways than, than only doing it in terms of giving rights. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, we, have, we have time for maybe two more uh, questions. Uh, yes, we've asked here in the front and there in the back to take the two, uh, <coughs> uh, the two of you. And then fortunate that there is no time for, for more questions in this formal uh, setting, but there might be time to, to talk a little bit with each other once we, uh, once we leave the, the, the room. Please, yeah. yes. Uh, the microphone, yes. yes. 
My name is Carolina Odufoyevian. I'm with myself here, but I've work, been working as an environmental lawyer for 20 years, both at NGOs and the uh, authorities. And therefore, I'm very interested in the, what do you think about existing, uh, existing uh, constructions of law when it comes to environmental law? Uh, that I think maybe could be used, at least, uh, if they were uh, constructed in a, in a good way. What do you think about the concept on uh, environmental quality standards? Is that something to build on? Uh, what do you think, uh, how do you uh, think that these issues that you're uh, um, speaking about connects to the old kind of environmental law uh, protection of species and um, the, the conservation law that we, that we have in uh, most of the countries. Uh, how can this, this be uh, uh, developed to, 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 to uh, see, uh, uh, be used in the way that uh, you would like? Yes. The last question. Yes. <coughs> Hello, my name is uh, Shahidul Islam. I work part time for the uh, university. It's called uh, International University of USA. My straightforward question is how environmental initiative could be workable to protect ecosystem and environment in, de uh, in developing countries? Because developing countries, ecosystem and environment are more vulnerable to the grid. I can give a specific example. Uh, you know, there is a uh, mangrove forest uh, that is situated in southern part of Bangladesh, which has been formed by the siltation of the mighty Ganges River over a few thousand years. But government is going to build up a coal thermal power plant within the 10 meter of corridor of impact area of uh, the mangrove forest, even though uh, local uh, NGOs and advocates raise their concern to stop building up <coughs> such a power plant because it will degrade the ecosystem of mangrove forest, which has been built over two thousand years. But the government uh, is going to build up that because not only local politics but regional politics is going to act as a vital role. So how? Uh, environmental measure could be workable to protect ecosystem and environment in developing countries. Thank you. Do you want to respond? You are the you are the center. <laughs> uh, your question. I think you, what you were asking was how do we build on the existing environmental laws here in Sweden? Uh, maybe to how do they how do we bring them? Um, how can we build on them perhaps to advance the rights of nature? Um, and there, it's been interesting to learn about like the environmental code and some things that are in there. So now we, um, I understand, and you spoke I think a little bit to it, but we've been talking a bit about, you know, in, in Ecuador as well as in the United States, those laws um, include provisions which empower people, which empower communities, um, which empower indigenous um, nations within Ecuador to defend and enforce the rights. So it's not just government that has that authority. Um, it gets a bit to this democracy question, um, our ability to, to govern ourselves. Um, and I understand that environmental NGOs here, at least some that meet certain criteria, have the authority to essentially have standing um, to try to protect nature here in Sweden, which is really, which, boy, would I like to have that in the United States. I think that's actually a really important provision to build on here in Sweden, um, if we were to move in this direction. And the reason that the rights of nature laws in Ecuador and the US um, specify who uh, these enforcement measures and empower not only government to defend and enforce these rights but people as well is because of that key question of standing if we have to constantly go into court and prove that we have the right to be there to protect nature um, that means it's very limiting um, and it's very expensive and it means that not a whole lot of cases actually go forward so essentially providing you know, we shorthand, we say like automatic standing for anyone under these laws means that you or I can go into court to defend the rights of a river. We think that's critical. And I think it's actually been really interesting to, 
So we think that's really, so certain environmental NGOs can do it now. Um, I think there's a lot to build on from that within the environmental legal framework here, and that's a good thing. I mean, as, you know, as I think we can all imagine, um, building political will to make transformational change is difficult. Um, it's generational kind of change, and if we can build on existing legal frameworks, that makes it so much easier. Um, and I think there's something there within Swedish law that we can we can look to. Um, so I, I think there is, um, and I'm interested in having more of that conversation, learning more about it within the environmental code and, and so on. Um, and then your question about what we can do in developing countries with um, with, uh, with ecosystems, mangrove and other ecosystems. Look, it's, this is not easy stuff to do. Um, but I can tell you that communities, not only in the United States, but others that we work with in different places, um, like with the indigenous Rizal people in Colombia, you know, the Colombian central government has tried very, very hard essentially to wipe them out as indigenous peoples on, their, on the San Andres archipelago. Um, and the people there are recognizing that if they're able, their ability to self-govern their ability to self-determine is integrally related with their ability, their right to protect the lands upon which they depend and which the central government has tried to strip away from them. And so we're working with them um, on really focusing on their right to their demo democratic rights and their environmental rights, both their human right to a healthy environment and the natural right. So I think part of the, to get to your point about developing nations, I think part of it is this need to not only focus on recognizing or securing the rights of nature, but also securing our rights to self-determine because so many people around the world, of course, don't have that authority. And those things we think are very important. And just lastly, to say to your point, which is people in communities, um, people in communities we think are often the best experts about the community, about nature within the ecosystems within that community and giving them the power to protect it through not only its self-governing authority, but also being able to have rights that they can defend of those ecosystems, we think, are very integrally related. Thanks. Did you want to? Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> so first, uh, a few points uh, on Carolina's question about existing laws. Well, I think one important point, and I come back to, to property rights, mm. is to, when, when the permit system were introduced uh, in some countries about 100 years ago and some later, mm. there was essentially for two reasons. One was that it would give a better opportunity to take a more holy general approach to the activity, what are the effects. But there was also the interest from the industry to getting some kind of immunity, that if you have the permit, yes. you will not be subject to legal challenges. To some extent, I can sympathize with the industries that if you make a big investment, you want to know that it can be run for some time without you having to make yet another investment two years later. But the important point is to say that if you're given a permit, that is not a property right in the sense that if that is reviewed in a couple of years, you should be compensated for the, uh, the new cost. And I think this is an important point to have. That you need to have a permit system, to give one example, which gives a certain protection for some time, but it's not absolute. If environmental situations change, if new technology is developed, if new other circumstances change, there must be a way to impose new conditions or even close the activity without compensation. If we take nuclear industry in Europe, this is an issue in Sweden, in Germany and other countries, nuclear industry is arguing that if, if there is a strategy to close down, they should be compensated. And I think that that is ridiculous. They have had long-term investment, it has paid off for decades. Why are they, why should they be, many of them are even public, partly public, public why should they be compensated if, in, if they in due time in advance know that this would be phased out within two or three decades? They have to, to, to live up to that without complaint. I think this is an important point to, 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 to argue. Another issue, you mentioned quality standards, and, I, and we should keep in mind oh, that yeah. quite, some of the laws which globally is still seen as very <coughs> radical was developed actually under the Nixon <coughs> administration in the US, environmental quality standard, environmental impact assessment, uh, and so on. Uh, and again, I think these are these somehow shifts, they do not legally speaking, don't start from the individuals, the right, but they try to set the standard of what is an acceptable level of protection. It may look good on paper. In some cases, it works very well, and I sympathize with that. On other areas, it's not so effective. But the important point is that if you have a right to a, a decent air quality, citizens should be able to enforce that. And jails should be able to enforce that. Only a few hundred meters from here, Sweden does not comply with EU air quality standards. But, and, but it's important that the citizen in Stockholm 
could somehow enforce that. And I think that is the challenge. The same with protection of species. In many countries, and I follow this very carefully within something that's called the Aarhus Convention, which is a convention that gives rights to NGOs and members of the public. In many countries where I follow this, they have quite advanced laws on protection of species. But if these laws are not followed, if the authorities do not do the job, there are no opportunities for anyone to challenge that. And I think that is an important point. It's not, it, it doesn't solve everything. It's not a panacea, but I think that is a crucial point. Just a short point on, your, uh, on the comments. I mean, it's a, bit, it's a bit ridiculous if I was the one to, to give advice on how local communities in Bangladesh should do. I mean, they would know better than I do. But what I, could, I think that it comes back to political strategies, but also legal strategies. And what we see is that in many countries where you have a poor environmental administration, sometimes the courts have stepped in and made very radical court decisions. There are radical court decisions in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in India, I, maybe in Bangladesh, I know in Colombia, in other countries, South Africa, where courts step in in a way that you would not see courts do in, in Northern Europe. And they try to, to deal with things, sometimes referring to constitutions, because there is no proper environmental law in place. But I think that, again, using courts, using parliament and non-parliamentary political, the movements that you are part of, I think, should be... And we, we, we should learn from what these movements do. So I cannot give you any further um, better advice than probably you can have yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think this was, was really enlightening. Thank you for asking all these questions to help us think further. We are obviously not done. I think one important issue is about bringing weather to court. Where, who can do this? No, this, this snow mixed rain that we're using to welcome you, Marta, I think is a shame. Um, you come back to that. I, I hope that you feel that you are warmly welcome. Uh, back again to continue this this conversation here with us. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mari, and thank you so much for joining us as well today, uh, Jonas. Thank you so much.